Hi, I'm Elaine Engelhart, and welcome to Discussions on Democracy. We're coming from Utah Valley University, and today our discussion is going to be on the privilege of writing. In the past, we've been talking about political thought or environmental concerns, but today we've brought top author Chris Radish, who was one of our own here in Utah about 24 years ago. And uh, she's joining us to talk about the 10 books that she's written, as well as some of the writing that she did with uh, Deseret News and some of the other organizations that she represented before. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me. And, and, and tell us a little bit about what you've been doing lately. Oh, the program's only an hour, so I'll try to keep it short. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I stayed in journalism for a long time after I left um, Utah Valley area and uh, worked for another newspaper and did a ton of freelancing. And for the past six years, I've been a full-time novelist with Random House. I write fiction now, literary fiction, mostly for women, but as you'll find out later, for really smart men also. <laughs> and uh, and I, liked, I like to think that I've created my own genre called Broads Who Have Been There. And uh, I, I write empowering stories about change. And I still do some nonfiction, and I just have completed another nonfiction book. Once you get that journalism stuff in your blood, it's very hard to flush it out. Oh, that's great. So. A and this is one of your comrades from 24 yes. years ago, Janelle Pugmire. Janelle, tell us about yourself. C currently, oh, you're, you're a reporter for, right, for the for Daily the Herald. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a reporter for the Daily Herald, but I did work for the Deseret News for 24 years. Chris was my first boss. And, and I've her been, best boss. Oh, my best <laughs> boss. I've still right. been a secretary or whatever. Administrative assistant is the glory name for it. But I started out doing obits and mm -hmm. babies and movie listings uh -huh. and Chris actually gave me my first try at writing a story with BYU students that were protesting the dollar movie being taken away Duh. and from that Duh. I've gone on and I've been able to do lots of things like I even interviewed Bob Hope so really? we're the having some good times. The stories we've told and Clark Harris really mm. knows how to tell a story too so Clark tell well, us about yourself. Well being Greek you can't always believe the stories I tell. I, okay. so we, All right. we lied to the Turks for 400 years so uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but, uh, actually uh, I'm one of the smart men I hope but uh, I'm here uh, had worked at the Daily Herald in the Valley had uh, worked at the Deseret News the Spanish Fork Press and then I crossed to the dark side and went to public relations and uh, I'm currently, uh, looks good on paper, the director of marketing for the state of Utah and I'm having a lot of fun. Utah just having been ranked number one by Forbes and you know a great place to sell and write about but uh, I, I miss the journalism side, uh, miss being on that side. It, so. It's nice that democracy covers all these areas, it though, is. isn't it? It yeah. is. And, and when I met Chris, I was with United Press International, and so we were covering some of the same stories <laughs> and, um, and, and having a lot of fun. Why is it important, Chris, I know this is re really a softball question, but that we can cover these stories, that we can tell people um, the news, the happenings. Well, one of my greatest sorrows in the past 10 years has been the demise of two city, two newspapers in each city. I, I'm, I live in Florida right now, and I read three daily newspapers. I'm very lucky. But to me, it, it's, the, it's the basis of democracy. It's, it's the ability to, to get different viewpoints and to make up your own mind. And when you take away that foundation, the, the basis for, for freedom of the press, uh, it's, to me it's very frightening. I get the fact that things are online and the world has changed, but um, I'm also, I guess, old school who started typing on a, on a typewriter. And I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's been a blow to democracy to have the demise of newspapers all across the country. Plus, it's just a lot of fun. It, it yes. is, isn't it? And, yeah. and you know, Janelle, I take three papers, one mm -hmm. of them yours. Thank you. And, and tell us, why do, you, why do you think it's important that you can tell the stories? Well, from my own personal experience, I'll tell you about the demise of things going on right here in Utah County. Um, with the online craze that's going on, we're losing, for instance, the Deseret News had a, a bureau here in Utah County, and with the uh, Deseret Media that they're doing now, there's more online attention. So my competition is leaving in some respect when we have all these newspapers going. So we might tend to get lazy or we might tend to have those closed door meetings that we don't know about because there's nobody checking and balancing what's going on in our government and in things like, you know, just regular day living in Provo. 
I'm not saying that's happening, but it can happen because one person can't cover the whole city, but two people can competitively cover what's important. And then it keeps our leaders on their toes and transparent as the new mayor of Provo would like to say. All right, thank you. How about you, Clark? Well, I agree with Chris and <coughs> I actually, my biggest fear is we're losing the fourth estate. I mean, the fourth estate is becoming an entertainment vehicle and not a news vehicle anymore. The reporting, and I don't know why, maybe it's the instant society that we live in. Everything has become instantaneous because of the internet, because of websites, this, that, and the other. Um, and I worry that we are gonna lose the fourth estate, that watchdog, and that, you know, we're, we're viewing people, and, and I watch him, I mean, we're viewing people like Matt Lauer as a news person, I mean, Katie Couric went from being, you know, you know, giggly Katie to now the CBS Evening News. I mean, we're wanting to be entertained more than we're wanting to be informed is okay. what I worry about. Okay, and then another worry, Chris, could be that um, media is now owned by five huge, giant, multinational, multi-global corporations. Right. Does this scare you? What do you think about well, that? Well, I've been frightened for a long time. I mean. No matter what we think, how altruistic we are about journalism and the written word, the bottom line has always been business. And for many years, mm -hmm. they have to make money. And for many years, when there was the competition and the watchdog thing that I think is incredibly important, and I think that's part of the problem with government now, is that nobody is watching them. The, the conglomerates, it's terribly frightening because, the, like I said, it's a business. And it used to be what Clark mentioned, the fourth estate where, I mean, I, I needed the paycheck, but for me it was a passionate job and I felt like I was a crusader and mm -hmm. I was representing all those thousands of people who couldn't go to the city council meetings, who couldn't, you know, go interview mm -hmm. the mayor. And, and I, it's, lo it's getting lost and it's, it's frightening. Your thoughts about the me megapolis that own the media? <laughs> well, I, I think I'm owned by one. <laughs> um, and, and it's true. I mean, we had our um, budget discussion at the end of year, beginning of year, and it seems like two-thirds of our building is marketing and advertising. And even though we're not on TV trying to get the ratings and doing the November thing and the spring thing, it is all about money. In fact, I had a professor at BYU that said it's sales and profits, baby. And that's what it is. Our newsroom is a sleek, slim, slender bit of few writers that can, you know, go out and I'm covering the two major cities in this county, plus the I-15 reconstruction, plus the university, plus, and those are big beats. And, mm. and that's, that's part of the problem. We're having to slim down, trim down, but certainly not where it comes to the money. Oh, yes. Well, you know, Clark, I think that some of my students might <clears throat> not understand what you mean by the fourth estate or being a watchdog. <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about this um, fourth branch of government. Well, the f and, and I don't even know who coined the phrase. Do you? Rem I mean, in so. history, I mean, but, but the fourth estate, I mean, you know, the watchdog over the other three, you know, divisions of government, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, I remember um, Chris when she was with the Deseret News and she covered Utah County. Uh, there was something to be said when she walked into a room and those politicians knew they were being watched. I mean, um, the, you know, the, we're, we're losing that, as I said. I mean, I think we're wanting to be entertained and actually now being on kind of the PR marketing side of things, the thing that is discouraging to me, but it's part of my job, the phone calls that I get from industry magazines, publications, as well as news organizations, not local but national, and they present, well, if the state of Utah would like to pay, we will put you on, you know, TV for five minutes, you know, I mean, it's, it's wow. kind of, it, it, as a former journalist, it's a little bit, you know, heart-wrenching, and then as a former journalist, I mean, even in Salt Lake City, I kind of, I still look at things as a reporter. And I see what's being missed, and I don't know what happened. I mean, um, and anymore, you know, you go to a news conference and you see they have their iPads and they have their, uh, you know, their, you know, their laptops, which that's great. I mean, you probably write your books that, that way. But the thing that was really, really comforting to me, we had the Wall Street Journal bureau chief from San Francisco in town a week ago doing a big story about Utah 
and he's probably my age, 50. He walked in and he still had a reporter's notebook. And I thought, oh man, somebody still, you know, and, and he had that passion that Chris talks about. I mean, and, and I'm not denigrating anybody that wants to use the iPad. I mean, I'm the wrong generation. Um, but th it was nice to see somebody was still hanging on to that because we're getting away from paper. I mean, yeah. the smell of paper and the feel of paper and that fourth estate is kind of what politicians and others used to be a little bit afraid of. And I see that fear going away. I mean... Well, the, the checks and balances, too. Yeah. It's like they did say, sit up and take notice when you walked in through them. When they knew a reporter was mm -hmm. there, things were different. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about later tonight is how I used to sneak... <laughs> I, nobody was covering stuff. And I used mm -hmm. to sneak under... They were having secret meetings. And, and it's just a way to keep... I'm not saying that, that politicians go into it and that they're crooked and that they were crooked. But it's, it, it's just a system, the fourth estate is a system to, to make sure people are doing what yeah. they're doing and just to be accountable. Otherwise, who are they accountable to? You can say, yeah, of course, when you go to vote, you're, they're accountable, but, you know. Did, did you find sometimes that folks thought you were their own public relations agency, that you were their clerk, <laughs> and they wanted to censor you, they wanted their spin on the story? Well, that happened all the time. Um, and. You know, I think part of being a really good professional is being able to have a, a, a relationship and they know that you can go out and have a cup of coffee, although no one drinks coffee here, ha ha ha. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and have a, a talk that doesn't have to do with work, but when it comes down to it, if they screw up, they know that they're going to be on the front page. You know, that's a very fine line to, to, to walk, but I think a good professional can do that. Well, what do you think about that now well, in your job? Well, it's been, it's kind of the... Uh, it's tough. It's tough to be a journalist. Yes. Uh, for instance, uh, these new wonderful fangled phones that we have. Yes. We are required as journalists now to carry those and if at all possible, on the dot, put out at least one paragraph via the internet on our phone from site, take a photo, get it online before the other guy gets it online. And where's the creativity in thought? Where is the balance of, oh, I've got to get this point of view, that point of view? Um, we're, we're all about getting it online first, beating it in the con And it, it takes a, I, I learned from Chris, actually, I learned from the bureau chiefs, that when a writer is out there writing the democracy part of it, this freedom of speech part of it, is the fact that we take those things and we don't, we don't necessarily editorialize, but we present both sides, let people see both sides, but in the writing, you have to have it in your story, both sides, not a paragraph coming from a phone mm -hmm. to online so we can beat the other guy. And it's, I'm, I'm having some real issues with that because I don't even know how to handle the stupid phone in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather write and take you know, those, those notes and, and ponder it and go, what's the significance? Which quote do I, which is the most important one? You know, I don't know and, if that answers the question, you, but... And now you just don't have But it's time. the passion. It's yeah. the passion yeah. of the journalist to get it done and get the story in. Um, I mean, and I think the three of us probably remember possibly turning over to computers. Before computers, mm -hmm. where we're still getting the AP mm -hmm. wires off of the, you know, yeah. things. And, and the newsroom was UPI talking. too. Right yeah. now, before they went out right, of Right, exactly. <laughs> well, see, right now, if I talk in my newsroom, I'm kind of like a disturbing soul because everybody's quiet. They got their earbuds in and they're doing their thing. To me, that's, I'm losing my passion because I've got to be yeah, sharing right. it and bouncing it off and saying, what do you think? And, and man, I've got this guy that's in the government and he's really getting people mad and, you know. Well, I guess the answer to the question then is how do, how do we adapt? How do we mm -hmm. keep democracy alive and uh, I mean can you keep democracy alive with a tweet you know I mean <laughs> you know, and a Twitter and you know I mean it, there's a role for the social media and there's a role for all of that you, you, you know, mentioned your students and every once in a while when I come back to BYU or the U of U and talk to a journalism course or any course one of the first things I ask is how many of the students there have read a newspaper that day or subscribed to a newspaper to a news magazine. I mean, you know, Newsweek is kaput, you know, I mean, but, and, and the really sad part is, is here you have a group that should have some passion for having that, and you have four or five of them who have even read the news that day before they came to class, 
or subscribe to a newspaper. I mean, you know, the democracy, I mean, our forefathers, Ben Franklin and, you know, John Adams, they owned newspapers. They started newspapers. They, I mean, John Adams, you know, anonymous letters and things like that. Yeah. I mean, um, we, generationally we've lost something and it's not been very many generations. And I just wonder where it's going because I truly believe it's more about entertainment than than that watchdog anymore. It's I don't want to you know I don't want to read bad news. I mean, uh, literally you know this week two weeks ago or in this last week, you know North Korea fired missiles on South Korea, bombed a city, you know wiped several blocks off the map. I have friends at work who they didn't know about it. They just didn't know about it. And they it. wonder why how, they need to know. How do you and how can you keep democracy alive when you don't even know what's going on in the rest of the world with democracy being shut down? They're not, they're not tuning in. People don't tune in anymore. I, I don't know. Very good. I, I would want to mention to your students and to anybody watching, I think one of the best movies that's been made in a long time is Good Night and Good Luck. Oh, that in is good. In black and white. But that will show with the McCarthy stuff going on. It is a wonderful story in what real hardcore journalism is all about. And I think it's a great thing to watch. It is. I, I, I like um, what the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and a few of the other major newspapers have done. They have um, readership programs on university and college campuses. And so our Vice President for Academic Affairs and our student body officers pay to have a daily distribution of the New York Times and um, mm. some other publications. They, oh, we get great. the Daily Herald and the Deseret this News. This is a perfect time. Your student body president, Richard Portwood, what did he yeah. just do? Just, just came back from Russia. Russia. Yeah. He was a guest of the Russian government. That's news. I was excited to be able to write that story. But I'm wondering, was I the only one in the whole state? He was, he was given a private letter by Vladislav Surkov, I think is how do you say his name? But it's, it, this is the top guy in the government next to the president and he's invited to sit next to him at a table to discuss for the first time things about this university, UVU. Isn't that wonderful? That's great news. <laughs> and it, he says he is. saw democracy in Moscow, the color that's coming into Moscow. But who knew about it? One person wrote about it. My students uh, read at least two stories from the New York Times before they come to class. And then we're going to discuss those two stories. Ah. And they can pick any two stories and I'll ask them what's interesting today. You know, so many of my, st my students um, don't think that they're entitled to have an opinion on the news. They think <laughs> newspapers are difficult to read. And it's very important to just hold those newspapers in your hands, smell the, smell the newsprint, touch the papers, and uh, read what the New York Times has to say for the right. day. So I'm still old-fashioned enough, but I'm hoping we can hang on to this for a long time. I don't know. How do you see it? Well, I mean, I'm an author. I'm a full-time novelist. Yes, yes. I want people to buy these yes. books. <laughs> yes. And, I mean, and I, I get it that they're e-books and the audio and all that, too, but I, I, I'm the same way. They're, I don't have a, a reader, and if you saw my cell phone, you would die laughing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kicking and screaming. I, I love my computer. But I, I don't know, and I mean, I'm just old enough to know that life is also very, goes in a circle. I mean, yeah. here I am back in Utah, for yeah. crying out loud. Right? You know, so the, the fact that in America, you know, and I talk about entertainment, the fact that I, we can be entertained is part of democracy, but, but you know, there's something comforting about that newsprint and, and everything else, and, and literally being able to fall asleep with a book on your chest or a magazine, and and for me, I mean, it's kind of, yeah, that's probably why I'm not married. I mean, I, I'm a romantic about waking up with a magazine, you know, but, <laughs> but, but there's something to be said about the fact that, you know, there, there's, there is still an, a lot of generation of news in this country, much more so mm -hmm. than most other countries. I mean, there are other countries where they're still try, they're trying to shut Google down. I mean, you know, China, no Google, you know, things like that. But, uh, but, but these, we can't lose this. And I like the fact that you have your students read and touch, you know? Yeah, and discuss. And, and can I just bring up something sure. on our computers at the Deseret News, and I think here at the Herald, we have a little thing we could push to see what level we're writing at. Uh -huh. And the average newspaper is about eighth grade. 
Uh -huh. So if your students aren't able to read that, they better get with it. They, they better. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and, and it's kind of an indicator of what's happening. Maybe Absolutely. I think it was in high school system. when I was there. What's happening? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was always I, told it was fifth. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, today I was talking to a student from Afghanistan who, who's on our campus and uh, visiting with him about democracy and about um, the need to read information. And he said, well, in our culture, we don't want to know what other people are saying. We don't need to know other people's personal opinion. You know, we just listen to the tribe. And so he said, when you bring mm -hmm. democracy to our country, we're not used to it. We're not used to having people expressing a lot of different views and having personal freedoms. What, what, what do you think about that, Chris, when you're trying to open that to a culture that's not open to it? That's an interesting concept, and I, I think that's one thing that journalism and, and being open makes us realize. We do have it made here in the country. My daughter is in Europe for um, seven months this, this year, and experiencing socialism and different forms of government, and I'm telling you, it's changed her life and how she looks at things. We are free here mm -hmm. in a way that people in Afghanistan and other countries are, and I think a lot of it has to do because of the written word, because we are exposed to so much. It's, it's sad. Well, it's, it is. Uh, in 1985, I uh, studied in the Soviet Union for three months with 18 journalism students really? from all over, the, all over the United States through the University uh -huh. of Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, I, was, I took a leave from the Daily Herald and went over and did that, and the interesting thing was the students that we, I mean, we studied with Cuban students, Angolan students, Polish, you know, Chinese. And the interesting thing was, as a young man that I made friends with in uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg now, uh, he told me when I went to leave after a month being there at the University of Leningrad, he said, the last thing that your country will ever want is for us to become democratic. You, we, we don't know how to be. I mean, and, and then you watched what happened. You watched what happened with Yugoslavia and the civil wars and... I mean, in, in the Soviet Union, they basically had a civil war. I mean, the Ukraine, I mean, but it's kind of exciting to watch them learn. You know, I mean, yeah. the Orange Revolution of the Ukraine is an amazing story, just an mm -hmm. absolutely amazing story. Millions of people coming into the capital city and in blizzards and not refusing to leave. That's kind of exciting, but, but it is, you know, how do you teach democracy? I mean... It, it's something we all have, it, we're inbred with, almost. It's a, I mean, it's a way of life. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and I, think, I think we often do take it for granted. That's why, that's why travel and, mm -hmm. and exposing yourself at a university level or any level, it, ju it just changes your life. It makes your world so much better and richer and deeper, I think. But was there ever a time where you felt like that, maybe your, your um, democracy or your free press was in question, that there were... Problems with it. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm, um, I have to be very uh, democratic about my answer. I did work for a newspaper for a very long time in Utah that was owned by the Mormon Church, and uh, th there were influences. And I would be lying if I said that's not part of the reason why I left, because it was it had a great deal to do with why I left. Um, so yeah, you, that goes. There's a circle that goes right back to your first question about um, the conglomerates that own the papers. And when, when the day is all over, unless you're working for someone who has the same values, it's all about the bottom line, who's got the best ratings and who sells the most newspapers. And in a way, it's always been that way. Um, you know, if you worked for the, the Catholic newspaper or the communist newspaper, your job is not just to, you're, you're carrying on their ideals and their ideas. And there is censorship. I'm, I'm not going to lie about it. Sure. I, about eight years ago, um, the um, Los Angeles Times uh, uh, had an editorial change and they decided they were just going to take down the walls between advertising and news and that the news reporters could write about things going on in the advertising world business and some of their best reporters walked out. Now, Janelle, why did those reporters just need to walk out? Oh, because there's, first of all, that wall's always there. I try it not to, you know, let me give you for instance, because I'm going to give you the local. Okay. I have advertising representatives that will come to me, this is an example, and say, hey, my client's having a grand opening, and they'd like to have you come and write the story about, you know, and, and there, it's, it's almost a, well, let's buy, let's, mm -hmm. let's deal, mm -hmm. let's trade with journalism. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so 
that advertising wall is there for a reason. Yes, they make the money for us, and we fill the, the spots that they haven't filled. You know, most people think it's the news that does it. It's the, the ads that go in first, mm -hmm. and then all the journalists fill in around that. And when you start crossing over, I mean, it's nice to have a, a working relationship, but when they start expecting, I'll buy an ad if you run a story. That is not journalism. Right. That's pandering, I think. Right. But, and and it's just another variation on the topic that Chris is talking about. Just, you know, what influence does come from the uh, administration to editorial to uh, advertising. There's a reason why the advertising offices are always nicer and bigger than the newsroom. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 They get more perks. Yeah. They get perks. A big reason. <laughs> yeah. Clark, your thoughts on this? Uh, well, it's like I said, I mean, I get, I, I, I took a telephone call today and we had a meeting with a magazine today, an in-flight magazine where we got all of the marketing representatives and PR representatives of Salt Lake City together. Um, the way the magazine pitched it was, get, have this meeting, we are going to do 40 pages of editorial copy about Salt Lake City. But guess what at the end of the meeting? It's, but we need to sell 20 ads, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and then In-Flight Magazine is not a journalism piece, but I mean, it just, it's out there. I mm -hmm. mean, you you know, you've got to make money to be able to put the news forward. Somehow, somebody's got to pay to have that 60-40 mix, you know, so that mm -hmm. people can read. But the problem is, is it's gone from 70% news, 30% ad, to 70% ads, 30%. I mean, advertising has won, mm -hmm. you know. Well, and, and let me just give you another... A taste of all of that here in Utah County it's almost like we're incestuous in our jobs mm -hmm. with um, us starting out as a journalist then they go to be PR people and then the PR people come to be journalists and uh, and I think you know what I'm talking about it's just this whole we all do the same thing I, I work with people in marketing that I worked with 20 years ago in journalism my journalism uh, friends from the Deseret News are now working in PR for the governor and other places and school districts and and we all just kind of take the rounds of what we can so we're carrying that journalism PR thing and you know what sometimes a journalist ends up doing PR when they really need to catch themselves and I'm sure I'm one of them yeah well well Chris Clark Clark here says um, it's not really journalism so what's what's, what's journalism and what's fluff well, journalism is when you're when you're writing without with no intent except to cover the story, mm -hmm. and you're doing it from, you know, any journalist who says they don't have an opinion is lying, <laughs> mm -hmm. but a true journalist will write the story, give both sides of the story, and and you just tell the story. You don't make any conclusions, you, and you don't think about who's paying for the ad. You're simply writing a story. That's true journalism in my mm -hmm. book. And, and you know what, I still have those pink colored glasses. I'm still <laughs> expecting that that's what my, uh. my stories are, that I've got balance. Well, and come on, I, I think probably all of us are avid readers of the New York Times. It's like, I, I like, I, I sleep with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I think the reporting, in a lot of newspapers, Wall Street Journal, there are still some great newspapers mm. out there and I don't think they'll ever go away. And, and so there, there is hope. And, um, it, it's still it's still out there. There's hope, and you know, Chris. Sometimes you just really, really get into a story. <laughs> yes. So tell us about how Run Bambi Run uh, was first uh, a news story that was an investigative story, and kind of the difference between um, how all these things developed well, to get this first book out, the first of ten. <laughs> When uh, when I was a working journalist, it was a it was a really it was an unwritten rule that you don't get involved with your subjects. You write the story and you might send them a thank you note or whatever, but that's all you do. Um, and that's when you're affili affiliated with a certain organization. When I got involved in this, I was a freelancer. I wasn't working for anybody but myself. And I did a magazine piece on a woman in Wisconsin who was convicted of a murder, and it was uh, it was just an update on her life. And as an former investigative journalist, I started got into the story, and I was like, "Oh my God, this woman was she didn't do it." And that's how that happened. And I became friends with her, and ended up writing the book. And uh, unfortunately, she just died last week. So that's how that whole process started. Could I have uh, been her friend if I was a full-time employee of the Deseret News? Or no, I, I would have never been able to write that book. I would have had to have quit my job, or I would have taken a leave of absence. 
but I felt because I was a uh, I wasn't working for anyone at the time but myself that that's my justification. Okay, Jan Janelle, tell us about that line and and why you you can't cross it. Oh my gosh, because you get in trouble from your editors. That's <laughs> oh, the first yeah. thing. Okay, um, <laughs> and you you lose your sense of pride in what your work is, and you you lose a. Um, I, <laughs> Oddly enough, I, I feel that there is a dignity in journalism for me because mm -hmm. I've worked so hard to, I mean, I was an administrative assistant secretary doing no bits. Now I'm a full-time reporter. That's so exciting for me. That is like, oh my gosh, I'm still excited to see my stupid byline I'm in the sure paper every are. day. Sure and and as, long, yes. as long as you have that for a writer, if you have that passion, that excitement and going, Oh my gosh, I'm in the paper and I made a one today. Oh, that's so wonderful. But I, I got to tell you, um, and I'm, I, I toot Chris's horn because I love Chris. Aww, we all but do. one of the best pieces of journalism that has ever been written at the Deseret News was on the Lafferty murders. And Chris was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize from that. That was pure journalism. And Chris went into some pretty scary places, was threatened with her life, had to change her phone number. She went where they were holding one of the wives incognito, clear across the country. She went and spent time with Brenda's family and in the, I mean, she did it. And, and it was pure journalism. And I gotta say one more thing. You gotta look at Chris's bracelet because I'm in love. She <laughs> has a it. typewriter yes. key yes. bracelet. We don't, we don't really do close-ups here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Chris, all, my, all, my, all the kids and anybody listening and watching that is probably one of the most inspirational pieces of jewelry I have ever seen. That's how we. That's how we used to work. Because those are yes. keys. That, I mean, it, it could the have been a linotype. I probably would have been yeah. excited about it. But <laughs> that is cool, Chris. You okay. know, Chris, that was a that was a tough story, wasn't it? The Lafferty. T tell us a little bit about what it was like. But it wasn't it awful. It, I mean, it, was, it was very awful. awful. I actually am going to. Um, I have a nonfiction piece. I'm going to read as a surprise in my during my visit here about um, that. Uh, that was a, a just a tragic, tragic story that I think really changed a lot of people's lives beyond the people who were involved in the murder. And um, it's something that I that I still think about. I think because it, during my investigation, which was like three months long, I mean, we, we uh, I lived and breathed it. You you get to know these people on such a, um, an intimate level that you you become part of their lives. And I think that's why the writing ended up being so so good. Um, it, it's it's a story. It's one of several stories um, from Utah that that are still right inside of me, and I think about all the time. You know, Clark, I remember when she was covering that story, mm -hmm. and I was getting tired of hearing about it. It was like it, it was like you know she had turned into this story, and it was like okay, yeah. get past it, start laughing again. But she yeah, was really well, was, so intense I was about this. Say, I was on the staff. I mean, uh, I worked for Chris at that time when her and Mike were doing that, and. And she, actually, she stopped smiling. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what you yeah. said, I was, as, as you said that, I was sitting there thinking about we'd come in the office and her and Mike would be locked away in, in their little corner, in their little corner of the world. And they would come out and I, you would see the police reports and the pictures and you didn't want to see what they were seeing because it was affecting them. I mean, we were a fun office. I mean, when you know, when Janelle goes in and she finds her desk turned upside down, and, <laughs> you know, and her cabbage patch baby swinging from the, the you know, the ceiling fan. <laughs> uh, I mean, the former boss uh, is my boss. This never really <laughs> happened. <laughs> yes. never really happened. I, I mean, and you know, we were in the old Jesse Knight building, you know, downtown yeah, guess, Provo. Yes. And it was always fun because we had buckets of water. And <laughs> yeah, you know, because whoever the got there, no, huh? whoever got there first dumped it on the other staff. Oh, Wait, no, no, that's when I went to go get the Daily Herald <laughs> oh, yeah, every day. Right. Yeah, okay. but, but no, the Lafferty murders, it was, an it was an incredible time for the entire staff mm -hmm. because we lived it with them and through them, and, I, and it affected us. I mean, I saw a picture that I can never get out of my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and to me, that's a true journalist, is someone that totally immerses themselves, and, and those stories were so incredibly vivid, and it made people realize there are evil people in this world. And I mean, and I have to tell you, I mean, I worked at the Daily Herald before I went to the Deseret News, and uh, the Lafferty's would come in and they would, they would leave their missives, you know, their, their scripture and their missives at the front desk, and people laughed them off. I mean, that, that was 
the sad thing was mm -hmm. that you know uh, they were laughed off but but I, but Chris and Mike I mean that what they did was tremendous but it was true journalism I mean they immersed themselves in it and, and can I just say this too we're still I'm still I'm sure Clark still we're still living the journalism story because the Lafferty story is not done yet right it's and not, that's oh. it's it Ron is still I guess I don't know if he's on death row but we've gone over it over it over it and more court cases and let's change this well, we still yeah. live the story well and we live in such a small state still I mean we right. really are a small state that actually now 25 years later I mean uh, you know I have family members who are now family members of the former wives and I mean different things I mean you know we're all it, Janelle mentioned incestuous in Utah we, we are such a small state that that had such a ripple effect on so many people and it still is I mean you know, you still drive by in Payson, and you go, "Oh, that's the Lafferty House." You know, that's where they were raised. That's I think. <laughs> the, I think the bottom line of, of anyone who wants to be a journalist or wants to be a, a creative writer is to be able to to get to evoke emotions mm -hmm. beyond telling a story. And what I w have been gifted with from all my years in Utah and the other places where I worked is I have this plethora of of stories and information and murder scenes and everything else that I can draw on now as a novelist. And, um, and that, that's been the gift I've, I get back from Utah, but the pain and agony and sorrow of, of these stories, uh, it, it lingers. And, and um, I think as, as a writer and Janelle, what you're going through now when you're covering your stories, you have to figure out on an emotional level how, how to live with that, how, to, how mm -hmm. to keep going forward and to learn how to smile and laugh again, which by the way, yeah. I've, I've gotten very good at. You are, yeah. but, <laughs> but, I, but I do have to tell you, like, one of the reasons that I got out of journalism, besides being offered more money, uh, you know, I, mean, I mean, was uh, it was scary sometimes when I would go to a Provo City Council meeting or a Utah County Commission meeting, and the next and there were twelve people there, and the next morning I realized a hundred thousand people were reading my opinion of mm -hmm. what had happened and what had transpired, and you know Chris is right. You know, for anybody to say, "Oh, I'm neutral. I have no opinion," you know, that's baloney. I mean, and I found myself seeing my opinion coming across. Mm -hmm. And then the other was, is as a journalist, it used to be that you had to keep your mouth shut. You know, you, mm -hmm. you couldn't have an opinion. You weren't supposed to have an opinion. My problem is, is politically, I do have an opinion. But, but one reason that I did look at leaving journalism was I wanted to express myself. I didn't want it, you know, I didn't want to just have to be able to tell the who, what, when, where, and why. I wanted... Sometimes I wanted to stand up in those meetings, and I'm sure Chris, <laughs> I mean, lots of, because you think about it, the journalist that goes and covers that week after week after week, they're more informed than anybody else. I mean, really, if anybody's going to stand up in a public meeting and say something, it ought to be the person that's been there night after night after Tuesday night, you know, and you have to keep your mouth shut. So I found myself wanting to leave to get more involved in the community, um, you know, uh, and and actually being afraid that my opinion was influencing people, and, and I should have fired you. You should have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, and, and on, on <laughs> that note, Elaine, yeah. with with what Clark is saying, just as a side note, I've been called to a jury four times. Three of those times, I was called to be the foreman because I was a journalist. Oh, and wow. they, the reason I asked why me, because you usually think they'll be dismissed instantaneously. But the attorneys said, at least in two of the cases, you know how to disseminate and to look at and to pull apart and to put back together and to see all of the levels. And that's what we needed for this case. And I found that, talking about democracy, that was very interesting because I was really actually a voice in something that wasn't a journalistic thing. And it was really a cool experience. Sure. Sure, and what you're talking about here in some of these, whether it's in court or investigating this uh, murder case, it's democracy within democracy, isn't Absol it? That absolutely. We, mm -hmm, absolutely. That we need to make sure that democracy is fulfilled when a uh, human life has been taken in such a, a dastardly manner. So. And, yeah. I, and I think it's good to talk about democracy. It's something that we, we, we relegate to the Democratic or the Republican Party without thinking about the true meaning of the word democracy, which in my sure. mind is just openness and by the people, for the people, how it was meant to be. And I think it's, these are very important discussions to have. It is. And I think uh, the value of uh, democracy and, and a journalist being able to tell a story 
Um, you look at what happened, has happened in the last two years in Russia, mm -hmm. the murders of all of, I mean, a half a dozen major journalists. I mean, you know, that they, they're stopping people from telling the story. I mean, the, they're, the people who are being gunned down are the journalists. And, and I mean, to me that shows, it, it's a tribute. It's an incredible tribute to those people who have died, but it shows you what we have the benefit of in our country um, and we, you know, we, you know, Janelle likes seeing her byline. People should be thrilled that that name is there, that somebody is there writing that and being their watchdog for them. I mean, uh, it, it's actually a tribute to the writer to have that name on there. Um, so. Gosh, thanks. It, it, well, it absolutely is. And um, so often we don't go back to that notion of democracy or that does it belong to any particular party. And it certainly doesn't, does it? Mm -mm. No. And so, no. just um, discussions that we can have uh, public schools and that our students can learn a large variety of material. Chris and I were talking about this today. It's so important that uh, students do have opportunities, not just with uh, news, but also with uh, a well-educated populace. It's, it's terribly important. It is. Yeah. yeah. So how hard was it for you, Chris, to move away from um, uh, doing books that were nonfiction into doing some fiction? It, it was a really easy transition for me. It's something that I thought about for a very long time. And I'm not saying making a living at it, it has been or continues to be easy, but um, I, it's been really wonderful for me. I, I miss, you know, I love talking with Janelle about mm -hmm. what she's doing, and I, I, I really miss if I had a, an opportunity to go back part time or do something in journalism again, I would I would do it. And I I have just finished a nonfiction book and I'm working on another one. It's really hard to to stay away from it. Uh, but but being a novelist is there are some times when it's just really nice not to have to look up all those facts and just <laughs> and uh, you know I'm not saying I don't do research, but it doesn't have to be. I mean you know like with the Lafferty story, I mm. I didn't just do things three or four times, I had a goal that I was going to verify things five times before I put it in there. And um, I'm doing some really heavy duty research right now for one of my new novels. And, and it's fun. It's, it's very much fun for me. I love what I do. I'm very, I, I want to say I'm lucky, but I've worked really hard. Oh, so. you have worked <laughs> hard. And, and I think that for someone to make it on your level is rather impossible. Probably only about 0.5% of the population really can be a success, really can sign on with Random House and have a, a, a base of fans who can hardly wait for the next novel to come out. Well, so. I had all these great stories that I covered in Utah that are just like in my writer's well that I, oh. you know, when something happens in Utah, it's not like your run of the day thing. It's usually like a really cool bombing or a <laughs> yeah. bizarre murder. It's just, you know, and. Uh, so in a way, it's been a unique gift, if, if I can say that. And I, mm -hmm. and, and I certainly don't mean to be disrespectful to the people involved in those stories, but there's a well of stories that I covered here that are still gurgling inside of me. Oh, well, it, they, they really do matter. They, they weren't just um, uh, some sanitized uh, incident. They, uh, they were people. Yes, they were. You Even have to understand, she comes from a spot where she was being shot at going down Provo Canyon. Yeah. I yeah. mean, let's let's really lighten up a little bit here. Chris has been some places, and I know Clark has too. But this is an amazing journalistic. I mean, Utah County, where you're getting shot at because you're writing a story. Yes, yeah. well, and, and and we saw the little town of Thistle flooded, oh, absolutely. ruined, gone, yeah. destroyed. I don't know if, yep. if any of the rest of you covered that, but yeah. I'd I'd go out there day after day and yeah. and just watch as they were. Uh, trying to divert the water, trying to get a dam going, trying to get a, a cut in the mountain. And That's amazing stuff. It mm -hmm. is, yeah, yeah. We, we're there for the groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, so. actually, I, I walked in, that literally the day that the uh, road started buckling, I walked into the Daily Herald as a student at BYU looking for a part-time job. They handed me a reporter's notebook and a pen and sent me up Spanish Fort Canyon. And uh, <laughs> I walked away with a full-time job. and. Uh, but, and, and actually watched the, the, the little school, where one-room school where my grandmother went to school, covered with the water, finally. It's, it's so, amazing that that had a connection wow. back to your family. Yeah, it did. But I want to ask Chris if, she has, if there's a book that you've written that is, one, is your favorite. Uh, I, well, my first novel, of course, has a very special place in my heart. 
but usually the book I'm working on right now is always my favorite book because okay. that's that's where my emotions and all my energy and you know now that I'm, I'm working on my my ninth novel all these characters are they're always with me and and the last ones are mad because I'm working on the, I, they all become very real to me they, <laughs> they really do I, I wanted to say something about you know certainly we had our big stories and what you said about how it's not always the big stories. Sometimes it's the little stories. It's the, it's the old bit you write about someone who had a, a remarkable life, or it's the baton twirler from 500 Street South. Yeah. You know, those stories to me were, mm -hmm. were in many ways almost more important than the big mm -hmm. stories, yeah. because that's she, what real life is about. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. My, oh, I'm my favorite that I did at the Deseret News when I worked for Chris was if you remember Omar Cater um, oh, sure. and the Cater family, but I, I mean it was a Palestinian family. Dis, you know they were displaced when Israel became a state. His mother and father end up in Utah, uh, have the orchards where the LDS Provo Temple is built, and his little old Palestinian Arab Muslim mother still lived just within you know just within a block of the LDS Temple. And I remember being able to go in and interview her because she was going to do her Hajj. She was finally going to do her Hajj, her trip to Mecca. And every more, five times a day, she prayed on her prayer rug facing the Provo Temple because that was <laughs> that facing was Mecca. <laughs> yeah. But this sweet little Palestinian woman shared, you know, mint tea with me and almonds and apples from her apple tree. And it's still, it, it's one that I have framed in my bedroom because she, she completed her cultural heritage from Provo, Utah, as a Muslim, and it, it was mm -hmm. the little little, little. stories that I got to brag again. It's okay. my job here on set. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think one of the most touching, sensitive, passionate, I will never forget stories was what she did. Chris did with Becky Barton. Oh. Mm. Ah. And so a young lady, oh yeah, <laughs> make <you> cry. <laughs> this is a young lady, she followed the end of her life with a, leukemia or cancer yeah, of some leukemia. sort. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my favorite ones, if I can brag about me, was just writing the story of the life of Arnold Freeberg. And, and the, it was one of my first big stories that I, I got to do at the Daily Herald as a new reporter there. What an important man and, and a figure in the world of art and talking to all these different artists. and. Um, that, that's also the benefit and the joy of the journalism is meeting all these different people and feeling, not just hearing, but feeling their lives and, and getting them to, to open up and talk to you about what they feel. Uh, that's just an, a remarkable experience that, that is the payoff. For, for doing all the stupid city council meetings where <laughs> nobody goes to, you know. Well, well so Chris, if you had a, a crystal ball, what do you think is going to happen to media? Do you think we're still going to like the stories on Arnold Freeberg and Becky Barton <laughs> and Omar Cater's great mom? What, are we still going to be reading those, or is it going to go to something quicker and faster and shorter? I'm, and I'm a total sap. I totally believe that it's still going to be there. I think those are the stories that tug at people's hearts and that they can relate to more so than they can relate to all the other stories. I think more newspapers will close, but I think the good newspapers will still be there. That, that's my... Yeah. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, locally, the Daily Herald's kind of showing that. They actually are are increasing in circulation. Is that right? That's right. Uh -huh. and, and they were the number third in the Lee group um, this past year. Wow. But but also that I think the reason why is because they've kind of gone back to the our towns feel the yeah. the town. Yeah. It's the smaller papers that are actually kind of staying alive, whereas these big, crazy ones are all going out. And I think that that. The people that are still, we're kind of still an agrarian. We, we could still take the afternoon paper here in Utah yes, County. Yes, we could. And sit and read with our, you know, before dinner with our feet up in front of the fire. But I think that, uh, that uh, there's, still, there's still some hope. What do you think, Clark? Is well, there hope? I, I hope there is. I pray there mm -hmm. is. Um, because like I say, I am a romantic. I mean, you know, I still subscribe to the papers, even though, I mean, I, I read them online, but I feel a loyalty. I, I need to have them delivered to, to my house. But, mm -hmm. but there's an interesting thing that I never thought I would see happen, and that is you know, my 69-year-old mother, who is a better person on the computer than I ever thought of being, <laughs> has gone from the kitchen table with the newspaper and a cup of coffee 
to her office with a cup of coffee and reading the newspaper on the internet. And I never thought I would see that happen. Um, so I think it's things like you're doing with your students and requiring or, or getting the subscriptions for them and, and getting that print in hand that will help keep things alive. And then books, um, you know, uh, you, people are always going to want to have the smell of a book and the feel of a book. I mean, and you know, you walk into a bookstore and there is no more sacred place in this world. I mean, to me, um, sorry, Janelle, I know you've got That's a few okay. sacred places That's that you right. like, but, <laughs> but you know, and, and even a Starbucks. I mean, I love walking in and seeing people drinking their coffee and reading the New York Times and a book in hand. I mean, um, you know, this, this is a connection that I don't think humanity will ever want to lose. I just don't see it happening. Uh, and, and so let's hope that the, the crystal ball is working there. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh. So, uh, Chris, tell us a little bit about um, what, it, what it seems like um, in the book publishing business. Do you think that, we, um, that it's as cutthroat and competitive as it is in, among journalists? You know, where it's we're worse. Trying, it's worse. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've just gone through a whole change. Um, when, when everybody downsized, so did the publishing business. It's been horrible. Uh, editors lost their jobs, p main publishers lost their jobs, people have downsized. It's, you know, it's hit, every, it's hit everybody. Um, and it is cutthroat. It's very, very difficult. We were talking at the very beginning of our discussion about marketing, and um, I spend half my time writing and half my time marketing myself. Yes, I mean, and we've all got yes, on. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, and go to the website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See pictures of our kids. I mean, you know, I'm here to, to give a speech. What if I was the kind of writer who, who couldn't do that? You you're actually end up being dead in the water if you can't get out and talk about yourself and your work, and, and it's not always easy. So there's there's two sides to everything. Uh, I, I happen to love both arenas. I, I love doing it both. If I had to pick, I'd stay in my office and write, but I, I enjoy getting out too. But it, it's a it's a jungle. It's a real jungle. And I think the days of I, the editors and people I work with at publishing houses now in New York, they're not even looking at on on they don't they don't look at manuscripts unless they they know the person or they come from somebody they know. It's really it's gotten very 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 difficult. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure. That probably less are being selected too. Right, and of course it's all about money. If they if they're if they're not going to get a bestseller, mm -hmm. uh, there are still a lot of wonderful editors who will um, take a take an author and nurture them and build them and and essentially that's what's happened with me. Uh, but th there are few and far between. It's very it's very tough business, but it is what it is, and part of it's kind of exciting too. Yeah. Well, Janiel, do you still feel that competition sometimes with uh, another reporter? Uh, oh, You were mentioning yes. that you need to get your, your photo oh, on your yes. iPhone. Easy, and, girl. Easy. <laughs> yes, and I love it uh -huh. because you know those people. Like I said before, we all know each other in this small area, and so you're going, I wonder what angle they're going to take. It's like you open up the paper and say, what meeting were they at? You yeah. know? Yes. And, and, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's a great feeling. Yeah. Yeah, there's a little there, but but it is kind of changing and going away a little bit. It it does. Yeah. And and how does public relations come into this whole mess? <laughs> into the, this mess, you said? No. Yes, this no. mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as Chris said, there you have to have half marketing, you have to have half journalism, storytelling, whatever. I mean, you do have to have the 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 PR schmucks out there, you know that. <laughs> sell the story, sell the politician. I mean, uh, and actually, uh, I, it, we, we serve a function and a role. I mean, uh, and you know, as Janelle said, I mean, one reason that I was able to move into public relations is, is I know journalism speak. You know, I mean, I think my friends in journalism like dealing with me a lot better because I know what they have, to, I know that they have to tell a story. And if there's a bad story to tell, I know they have to tell it. That was one thing that I always admired about Chris, was she would walk into a council room and the politicians knew, okay, here the reporter is. Next day you might see her at coffee with one of the county commissioners who she had maybe written not such a nice story about, but they respected her and knew she needed to, to do the job and tell the story. And uh, you know, marketing, I mean, we're hit by 12,000 messages a day or more, you know, and I enjoy the uh, challenge of, it, of making sure that one of the messages that they hear, see, and feel is mine. And so, there's, so the, 
PR, you have that competitive element too. I mean, Absolutely. and the product that I sell is a state that I love and a governor that I love. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's exciting for me to see, you know, the Wall Street Journal be willing to come and I pitch a story and he comes and, you know, he comes. It, that's a win for me. That's huge. You know, that's so big it's, time. it's fun. And so I'm still involved in the journalism side, so. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, we're getting ready to wrap up, but I'm always telling my students that you must write. You must be a good writer, and if you're ever going to be successful in life, in your job, you need to be a good writer. And when I moved from journalism into academia, I um, uh, always set aside writing time for my scholarly writing. In fact, um, when I wrote my um, master's thesis and then my doctoral dissertation, they were done from uh, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So <laughs> oh, no. I, I still had children, and uh, those were those were my hours. How, what would you recommend for writers, and how would you tell them that it's important and they have to make time for it? I get asked that question all the time. I get people, I want to be a writer, I want to write a book. Well, in order to be a writer, all you have to do is put down one word on a piece of paper, but you have to do it. And, and I, you know, I'm a writer and an author, and I believe that it's the key to everything. Good writing is the key to success no matter what arena you want to go into. So sit down and do it. Write every day if you can. Uh, I'm not a journaler myself because I'm writing all the time anyway. But it's a great way to start and it's a great, great way to get your feelings out and to see where you can go with things. But yeah. you do do the blogging. So. Yes, I do blog. Well, that's sort of my, um, my, my form of journalism, which is <laughs> <laughs> it's my way to, I, I did a syndicated column for about eight years, a national column after I left here, and uh, boy, when I quit that, I really missed it. So mm -hmm. blogging is kind of a nice, nice way to fill it in. You can say whatever you want. Talk <laughs> yeah. about democracy. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love, I love it. I really love it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It has been so much fun to reunite you with Janelle and Clark <laughs> and me and uh, that we could talk about this subject that is truly dear to our hearts, democracy. Absolutely. So, thank mm -hmm. you very much to Janelle Pugmire, to Chris Radish, and to Clark Karras. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks.